Okay, so I guess uh, let's get started. Um, it's my great pleasure to have uh, Professor E.H. Yang from uh, Stevens Institute of uh, Technology. Uh, 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 Professor Yang prefer us to call him uh, E.H. So uh, uh, he uh, got his uh, bachelor's and a PhD degree from uh, Aju University in, in South Korea. And he is actually known as the first Korean to receive a MAMS PhD. He joined uh, Stevens in 2006. And before that, he was a postdoc at the University of Tokyo and a senior member at a Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, Dr. Young is a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and a fellow of the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. He has received a number of awards, including the Lou Allen Award for Excellence in 2003, the Award for Research Excellence at Stevens in 2019, and most recently, the IEEE Technical Achievement Award in 2020. Um, Dr. Yang has an impressive funding record, you know, over the years, 8.5 million from almost all federal funding agencies that you can think of. Um, Dr. Yang also served in various editorial board positions, including scientific reports and IEEE C uh, census journal. Um, uh, the way we get connected is that recently I read a paper published by EH where they reported the room temperature flow mechanism in 2D transition metal dye charcoal organized. This is actually what my group has been trying to do for years and didn't have any luck. So congratulations, EH. Um, EH's work in 2D materials in general also overlap very well with many groups here in physics, electrical engineering, and the materials design and innovation departments. Therefore, I invited him to give a talk uh, on the topic of air stability, uh, doping, and the magnetism in TMDs. Um, I hope uh, he can visit us in the near future and for in-person discussions and uh, possible collaborations. So without further ado, welcome Professor Yang. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hao, for inviting me and for the Zoom talk and also thank you for your kind introduction here. I'm going to talk about air stability, doping, and magnetism in transition metal dicarcogenides or TMDs. Uh, especially focusing on in-situ doping of TMD monolayers enabling 2D dilute magnetic semiconductors. Uh, let me first briefly give my background with my past work a little bit here, my PhD and postdoc training. Uh, so postdoc training at the University of Tokyo and Caltech uh, was based on microelectron mechanical systems or MEMS. I assume that you guys know uh, the word MEMS here. And that, uh, at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, I worked in developing MEMS actuator technologies, including linear microactuator, we call this the inch one actuators, electroactive polymer actuators, and piezoelectric microvalves and form meters, which all required a bunch of uh, MEMS actuators uh, behind those uh, plates and so on and so forth for space applications. And I moved to Stevens uh, in the year of 2003 six and uh, shifted gears to the nanomaterials research and my group explored uh, graphene growth and graphene photo detectors as well as carbon nanotube based stretchable supercapacitors and sensors we've also worked on cvd growth and characterization of tmds um, and our recent research interests included synthesis and characterization of 2d dilute magnetic semiconductors based on tmds so let me start. Uh, Richard Feynman received the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1959. He gave the famous lecture at Caltech, uh, there's plenty of room at the bottom. In that lecture, he said the following, what could we do with layer structures with just right layers? What would the properties of materials be if we could really arrange the atoms the way we want them? I can hardly doubt that when you have some control of the arrangement of things on a small scale, we get an enormously greater range of possible properties that substances can have. This prophetic remark was realized when Gaiman and Novoselov first, first isolated graphene from graphite, uh, resulting in receiving the Nobel Prize for Physics in 2010. This discovery of graphene shows how new physical properties emerge when a bow crystal is thinned down to one atomic layer. 
But it is interesting to know the fact that single crystals of molybdenum sulfide, several molecular layers thick, were actually exfoliated in 1966 already using the same scotch tape method for exfoliating uh, graphite that was used for the first graphene isolation in 2004. And this work was done in 1966. Another one is uh, single layer molybdenum sulfide chemically exfoliated in 1986, although it appears that these were not draw much attention. So sometimes it may be, it may be not a good idea to do things too early you know, before the research community has awakened. <laughs> anyway, the key to the success of graphene is its range of remarkable properties from high electron mobility and mechanical strength to uh, transparency and flexibility. The light graphene interaction can be adjusted using an electric field or chemical dopant making graphene-based photonic devices tunable. This is reflected in this range of potential applications from electrodes for supercapacitors to membranes for water desalination and from flexible electronics to spintronic devices. And 2D materials are comprised of layered van der Waals solids, including hexagonal boron nitride, phosphorine, maxine, and silicine, and transition metal dicocogenide, TMGs. Unlike graphene, which is a gapless semi-metal, some TMD monolayers have a direct band gap. This means that they can directly be used in electronics and optics, complementing graphene. Um, since 2010, there has been an exponential growth in the research on the increasingly broad portfolio of 2D materials. The number of publications per year on 2D materials jumped exponentially from a little over 100 in 2010 to several thousand in 2018. And this is uh, the data I have, so I don't probably 20, 20 now, maybe it's uh, 10,000 or so. Um, the research of TMDs opens up important applications from uh, electronics, photonics, energy storage, and the nanomaterials, I mean, nano medicine biosensing to uh, spin valley electronics using spin valley coupling in TMDs. However, it should be noted that. Most of the scientific research in this area has been focused on exploring exotic properties from exfoliated flakes. No one would argue that for any practical applications in the future, these materials must be synthesized uniformly on a large scale. To this end, synthesis of these materials has also been explored, including the first heterostructures growth of TMD monolayers using LPCBD, where you can see the randomly distributed disoriented flakes. And the wafer scale monolayer growth and transfer of TMDs using MOCVD was demonstrated successfully. This was really a phenomenal work here. But the growth of monolayer heterostructures is still challenging. So the area is still in its early stage if we talk about the control of production of large uniform high quality layers and monolayer heterostructures. And there are a number of challenges facing the TMD research beyond the scalable synthesis, including control, controlled growth, control of grain boundaries, defects, air stability, and control of doping to make alloys of 2D uh, materials here. Uh, my group has pursued the controlled growth a little bit, maybe half success, um, including location-specific growth where we showed a selective growth of TMD monolayers on desired locations without a post-lithography. And we studied the stability of the CVD growth of tungsten sulfide bilayers. This study was led by my theory collaborator, Data at NGIT. In this uh, DFT modeling, we studied two tungsten-based carcogenides. Uh, the results shows that the preference of forming the carcogenide terminated structures over the metal terminated structures to for bilayers. Well, in fact, in my group, we were rather interested in learning the growth mode and mechanism of forming AA or AB stacking of those uh, homo bilayers through experiments and modeling, and we haven't got, it, got them yet. And as we, because this is because we observe the growth of, do you see the cursor here? Uh, the, we observe this growth of aligned. So in this case, on the, uh, up here, you will see this aligned, and on the down here, bottom here is the 60 degrees tilted growth of tungsten sulfide uh, homobile layers, um, and which depends on how we tweak the growth parameters during the bilayer growth. 
uh, we could have obtained a deeper understanding to controllably grow homo bilayers or probably triple layers or more. And this work was not entirely successful again. Uh, the reason is uh, to understand the atomic structure at the interface, the high resolution STEM imaging was performed and there was a uh, in collaboration with Teranos group at Penn State. But unfortunately, after some in-depth analysis of our grown samples, we could not reach an agreement on the interpretation of obtained results. So we have not been able to publish this work. So another key challenge would be the control of defects and useful parallels can be drawn with gallium arsenide where control over materials quality was achieved over decades of work. Um, so one of the critical issues associated with defects is temporal degradation. This uh, degradation of TMDs is due to uh, in-air oxidation. So uh, you can see as an example here that the exfoliated molybdenum is gone in a week in the air through the oxidation. And defects sites such as vacancies or grain boundaries in TMDs are known to promote in-air oxidation of the materials. While graphene is relatively air stable, dealing with, you know, uh, black phosphorus and silicine kind of uh, materials would be a pain in the neck due to their instability there. And sulfur-based materials such as tungsten sulfide are most stable in the air, but it doesn't mean that they can last forever in the air. For example, look at this uh, CVD grown tungsten sulfide sample from day one, five, and 13. Let me go back. I'm not sure if you can see clearly through zoom. <laughs> day one, day five, and 13. What do you see? you can clearly see the grain boundaries that are oxidized, right? And what happened here is that tungsten sulfide is turned to tungsten oxide along the grain boundaries. So that, that's uh, done in like a couple of weeks, okay? So uh, here we characterized it because of this kind of thing. We have, uh, you know, we have decided to work on this and we characterize the uh, tungsten sulfide oxidation in air and it's a substrate dependence using the underlying graphene substrate. Because we were working on this bilayer growth, the growth of TMDs on graphene directly, and we learned that those materials grown on graphene as opposed to those materials grown on oxide show different oxidation behavior. So here are figure A, B, and C show these optical images of as grown and oxidized tungsten to survive monolayers on an oxidized silicon, you know, oxidized silicon substrate. So on A is, is as, as grown and B, you see it's too small, probably you can't see it, but you see this uh, uh, grain boundaries are oxidized. And C case, this is a defective sample. You may, maybe it's uh, started from dirty or maybe something is defective. So you have a lot of defects then these oxidation can occur from the interior of this uh, grain boundary. Um, so can I ask a question? Sure. Um, so uh, are these uh, TMDs grown abtextually uh, by Van der Waals abtexy or? Yeah, it's the Van der Waals abtexy, but it's the same CVD process, but it's uh, yeah. um, So let me continue here. So uh, figure D here is uh, a sample grown on oxide. This is tungsten sulfide grown on oxide uh, after four months. So you just put it in the sample in the air, four months, you're just do, do, doing nothing there. Because but the, what happened here is D is totally oxidized. And there is, this is confirmed in figure E. This is a Raman mapping where you see the complete quenching, Raman quenching here, indicating that the material is almost fully oxidized. So there's no uh, tungsten to surfide anymore, All right? So uh, what happens here is, so now we tested another sample that we grew on graphene this time, okay? Same tungsten to surfide grew on graphene, okay? grown in graphene here. And this is a false colored image in uh, figure F here. Um, this is false colored SCM image of epitexturally grown tungsten sulfide monolayer on a graphene substrate. Here, the graphene was transferred to an oxidized silicon substrate before growing tungsten sulfide on top. So you first make the graphene, then we grow directly on the graphene. So the SCM image was again taken after four months, you know, uh, as like D and E case, this F is F and G, also, this is from the sample after four months of exposure. But you can see the clear difference because you see the Raman quenching from figure G and along the grain boundary only, which contrasts with the tungsten sulfide grown on oxide that was fully oxidized for the same duration. So this means that the oxidation rate was, was much slower on tungsten sulfide grown on graphene. Finally, the uh, tungsten sulfide on graphene was transferred by etching oxide 
onto a TEM grid. Sample was left for 10 months in air. And what happened was we found that the material after we uh, characterized was not oxidized at all. We couldn't find any quenching, Raman quenching from the sample. So likewise, we also uh, performed the XPS measurement here. So XPS spectra here, uh, atop here, J is from the Asgron tungsten desulfide monolayer and K is oxidized one. I is the 10 month old suspended sample. And as you can see, J and I, uh, J, K, L, not I, sorry. J and L show the same pattern, implying that the, uh, again, there's no oxidation there. So our explanation here is that the charges or dipoles in the silicon substrate generate uh, electric fields in the oxidized, oxidized surface, which in reinforce the adsorbate TMD interaction by inducing an electronic charge transfer, affecting rate of tungsten dissolved by oxidation. Tungsten dissolved sample on graphene case. This graphene in this case screens the surface electric field from oxide thereby reducing the rate of oxidation. In the case of tungsten sulfide on graphene suspended sample, this electric field effect would be completely gone, showing a complete lacking of oxidation. So that's our sort of explanation. So to, to further confirm this explanation, we performed an uh, experiment on local oxidation of tungsten sulfide using the voltage applied AFM. Uh, cantilever tip here to locally apply an electric field onto uh, the tungsten surface center here. So on D, here you, you see the center, and C, you see the center, and D, you see also this center here. So figure B and C are SCM and AFM images showing uh, the monolayer oxidized at the, at the center using the voltage applied AFM. And D, this is a Raman quenching of the same area, which confirms the area was oxidized. So that was the uh, um, uh, work uh, that we uh, published in advanced materials. Now, let me move on to the topic of 2D magnets. Um, recent couple of years, we have worked on doping of transition atoms into TMDs, including moly uh, the sulfide, tungsten sulfide, and moly the selenide. And it turned out that the doping of TMDs is crucial for creating 2D magnets. So that was our kind of uh, starting point there. Um, journal science suggested questions that point to critical knowledge gaps the ground rules were such that scientists should have a good shot at answering the questions over the next 25 years. And they ended up creating 125 questions, matching number for 125th anniversary of science. And one of those 125 questions was about magnetic semiconductor working at room temperature. And pointing out that Curie temperatures of those materials must be high enough for practical applications. Um, so since uh, the year 2018, there have been several review articles published in Nature, Science, and Advanced Material, and so on and so forth about two-dimensional magnetic crystals and heterostructures. And one of the papers listed here, uh, potential research topics for magnetic Van der Waals materials. And the first on the list was the room temperature ferromagnetic material, which we were uh, working on. And uh, Another research uh, review article, Nature and Technology by Novoselov and the uh, published in Science. All of these review articles mentioned that as soon as 2D magnets can be reliably synthesized with sufficiently high Curie temperature, the potential for technological impact is enormous. Here I want to uh, pick uh, two keywords. One is the uh, reliable synthesis and the other is high critical temperature. Um, Dilute magnetic semiconductors are materials in which ferromagnetism and semiconducting properties coexist. Therefore, these materials offer the capability of manipulating spin polarized charge carriers for information uh, storage applications. So doping of transition metal elements such as irons and manganese into non-magnetic bulk crystals is known to facilitate the formation of dilute magnetic semiconductors such as p-type manganese doped compounds. Notably, the observation of a Curie temperature at 110K in uh, manganese doped gallium arsenide led to the pursuit of formation of dilute um, magnetic semiconductors with their Curie temperature at or above room temperature. So that's a 3D. Now, if this ferromagnetism is enabled in 2D crystals, what would happen? Combined with their already rich electronics and optics, it could lead to new discoveries and applications. For example, heterostructures and devices based on 2D magnets are expected to possess a great uh, you know, property here, 
uh, with strong application. This is because 2D materials are largely decoupled from substrate, right? And the 2D materials allow electrical control and are mechanically flexible, and 2D materials are open to chemical functionalization. So basically, you uh, bring all these uh, ex exquisite properties of 2D material into magnetism. So 2D magnets can be further integrated into emergent heterostructures that allow the research on the interplay of in in distinct physical properties, giving rise to emergent you know, interface phenomena. So notable experiments uh, include the, uh, in, in this uh, regard, uh, would be giant magnetic resistance and spin filtering phenomena in 2D spin valves and uh, tunnel junctions, and et cetera. Okay, so in early 2017, the first observations of ferromagnetism were uh, reported, but those materials were either insulators or conductors, and some of their monorails were un un unstable. And although this work was really phenomenal and there was really a starting point of this thing, another great work reported in the same year showed enhanced value splitting demonstrating more uh, monorail tungsten the CERN eye on a European surface substrate by the Professor Zengru, and this work used the magnetic proximity effect. Another work uh, using the magnetic proximity effect was a monorail tungsten the CERN eye formed on 10 nanometer chromium tridite, also showing the ferromagnetism. Um, as you can see, the ferromagnetic properties were all uh, demonstrated cryogenic temperature at this stage. Now, employing a direct vapor uh, phase method as opposed to uh, exfoliation, uh, ferromagnetism was reported for iron doped tin disulfide, okay, and but the with its uh, curie temperature 31 K yet, but um, and also this approach still used the mechanical exploration after growing bulk crystal, so it's not exactly a growth. Another study on the right top here shows a post growth incorporation of vanadium into moly uh, telluride monolayers, giving rise to room temperature ferromagnetism, but this is uh, in the form of small randomly distributed clusters that are not uniform. Bottom left shows the vanadium doped the dicelerite grown on HOPG or uh, molytosulfide, also showing ferromagnetism at room temperature, but the flake size, as you can see, is order of 100 nanometers. It's very, very small. Another one is on the right bottom here, gate tunable ferromagnetism demonstrated in exfoliated 2D FGT, where an ionic gate uh, raised Curie temperature to room temperature. Okay, really fascinating work here. Now, as described in the earlier topic, for practical applications of 2D magnets, we will need air stability first, right? Um, I mean, uh, you know, those some materials uh, uh, such as chromium triiodide and some other materials, even with the HPN encapsulation, you know, uh, you know, it still shows temporal degradation. So this is a significant problem here. In addition, as described from the uh, review articles in the earlier uh, slides, the material's Curie temperature must be at or above room temperature. Furthermore, having 2D dilute magnetic semiconductors will always be a plus. Here's why. The traditional electronics are based on the control of charge carriers. However, practical magnetic semiconductors would also allow control of quantum spin states. So we, we might uh, be able to do more there. Um, uh, this will theoretically provide also near total spin polarization, which is an important property for spintronics also. So here I give an example here, magnetic tunnel junction. Uh, so let's take a look at this. So the MTJ is a modern spintronic device that can be used for processing a bit information, the bit information stored in the nanomagnet. The active area of MTJ uh, typically consists of two ferromagnetic electrodes with a thin insulating bar barrier here. So here, uh, high, um, free layer, barrier layer, and fixed layer. You see this cursor here? So uh, the space layer is extremely thin. Uh, so um, for example, manganese oxide in nanometer or sub-nanometer range uh, are used here. So the MTJ has enabled the development of spin transport torque uh, magnetic random S, uh, excess memory, STTMRAM, uh, for data storage and computing applications where spin polarized current exerts a spin transfer torque to change the magnetization direction of a nanomagnet. And conventional processes require sophisticated and expensive processes as well as uh, facilities, uh, including, so this is an example from uh, the, the famous uh, Stuart Parkin, and uh, 
including uh, MBE spurring and PLD magnetron to synthesize such 3D structures in great precision. Very expensive process. On the other hand, we may be able to construct such an MTJ uh, device solely using 2D materials in the future, relatively easily, with some maturation, of course, right? Okay, so back to the critical factors for 2D magnets. The third uh, critical factors would be scalability. In other words, one must show the potential to synthesize the materials uniformly over a large area. The scalability is another critical requirement for practical applications, so we need to pursue the CVD growth over the exploration. However, before the year 2020, there was none such report that simultaneously meets all three requirements. Now, first crimson post studies predicted that doping of transition metal ions into TMD monolayers is a promising way to realize 2D dilute magnetic semiconductors with a purity temperature at or above room temperature. So one of the DFT studies shown on the right here showed the possibility of a iron uh, disulfide phase formation in the molybdenum uh, disulfide structure. The modeling showed that the introduction of only a small amount of iron uh, atoms leads to a change in their magnetic properties, which motivated us to explore this approach of iron doping of molybdenum. Doping is a fundamental requirement for tuning and improving the properties of conventional semiconductors. Regarding the doping of transition metal ions into TMD monolayers, there have been a few studies, including niobium doping of tungsten sulfide and uh, um, rhenium doping of molybdenum sulfide and manganese doping of molybdenum sulfide monolayers there. However, ferromagnetism has not been observed from these studies. But since I have also learned that Professor Zhang's guru has done manganese doping in his unpublished work, things may change in the future. Um, so here we can see that the iron doping is quite distinct from previous doping experiments reported elsewhere. Because the melting points of manganese, niobium, and rhenium are from 154, 204, and to uh, 400 degrees C. Okay. And because of that, these dopant sources, when you grow these and uh, dope those, um, um, these sources were placed outside of the major heating zones, as you can see from the figures on the bottom. On the other hand, the melting point of iron oxide used to dope molybdenum uh, sulfide with the iron is close to uh, 1600 degrees. So obviously, you cannot use the same doping methods used in these uh, uh, earlier studies. Right, so what do we do? But luckily, it turned out that our growth method itself happened to be well optimized for the iron doping. In our process, a thin film of moly trioxide is deposited onto a substrate. So instead of using powder, we use thin film, which then contacts another substrate face to face. The sandwich sample is loaded into the tube with sulfur powder placed upstream of the growth area for controlled sublimation, after which the furnace is heated uh, to grow TMDs. Okay, so the TMD growth is based on a reaction of transition metal oxide and carcogen powder in vapor phase. The growth mode is correlated with several parameters, including cater gas, temperature precursors, and subs, uh, substrate. And uh, we have very little understanding. Also, I, my group has done this uh, growth, but I have to confess that uh, we have very little understanding how it works. So we found a couple of papers uh, solely devoted on uh, the mechanism, growth mechanism experimentally. So these, according to these two, two papers, for the molybdenum sulfide growth, the initial reaction between molybdenum trioxide and sulfur produces uh, intermediate volatile suboxide, and then further sulfuration of the suboxide on the substrate leads to a complete conversion into molybdenum sulfide grain. So not much helpful. Uh, as for the institute iron doping process, all we need to do here is to add iron oxide particles into the process. Well, of course, it is easier said than done. You know, to do this as uh, you know, students had to put in hundreds of hours of their work to obtain the right growth and doping conditions. So, you know, uh, this is hard work. But anyway, here we start the doping process simultaneously by casting uh, iron oxide particles onto the substrate and basically we perform the same process of growth. The substrate contacts the molytrax film deposited uh, substrate face face here and the 
iron and hydrogen sulfur and sulfur are supplied at optimized timings and temperature and the sample is heated for an optimized duration before being cooled down to room temperature where iron dope molecular sulfide monolayers up to millimeter size can be obtained. Here, figure A is an SEM image of a single crystal molecular sulfide, tungsten dope, I mean, um, iron dope molecular sulfide, where the scale wise four microns here, by tweaking the uh, growth conditions, so we obtain continuous polycrystal monolayers with size of up to millimeter. We haven't tried going larger there, but potentially this could be uh, going larger, like into vapor scale, we think. Uh, but we, we haven't done much uh, in, this, in this regard. Um, the figures on the bottom shows the, show the temperature dependent PR spectra of undoped and uh, iron doped uh, molecular sulfide. And here, confirming the substitutional doping is critical since the magnetic transition must come from the doping of iron atoms, not from other sources such as residues on the surface and interstitially doped atoms, and so on and so forth. So, we performed this higher angle annular dark field STM imaging, and on the left is for the uh, is uh, iron of the tungsten sulfide monolayer. On the right is molecular sulfide. Here, the brightness of atoms in STM images is directly proportional to the scale of the atomic number, so we can confirm the substitution doping of iron atoms replacing tungsten or molybdenum sites using the STM intensity profile on the center here. Okay. Okay. Now, one of the key features in our findings is the iron-related emission from iron dope molecular sulfide. The figure on the left shows the low temperature PR emission of the molecular sulfide and the iron dope sulfide, uh, I'm sorry, iron doped molecular sulfide monolayers, where we find the emission peak here at 2.28 eV, which is very distinct uh, from the sample. And we further corroborated this using uh, DFT calculations of dipole allowed transitions in iron doped samples. And this was done by Munil group at R RPI. Um, the control experiments now show that the iron related emission is only observed from iron doped samples. There was no such emission from undoped samples from, with the iron or iron oxide clusters placed atop, indicating that only substitutional uh, incorporation of iron creates this certain transition. We have further scrutinized this, this uh, emission here, iron-related emission here, using the magneto PR measurements here. Um, so uh, transition metal ions show unequal amounts of uh, light absorption when excited with left and right-handed circular polarization, right? So the iron-related PR spectra under excitation with opposite circularly polarized light at both 4K and 300K here show a strong uh, uh, circular dichroism here. So given that the transition matter's luminescence loses its circular dichroism above the Curie temperature, the fact that we observe a strong uh, circular dichroism at the room temperature, that means that uh, this iron dope molecular sulfide remains ferromagnetic at room temperature. Um, since at the atomic level, the light absorption is closely related to the magnetically, magnetically induced uh, Zeeman shifts, performing magnetic circular dichroism spectroscopy also gave insights into the magnetic properties of the material. So here, the magnetic circular dichroism of the iron-related emission shows the pronounced hysteresis loop as a function of the increasing and the decreasing magnetic field. So this clearly demonstrates the uh, ferromagnetic nature of the iron-related PR emission. To further quantify the local strength of the ferromagnetic field at room temperature in the iron dope molecular sulfide, we performed the magnetometry using nitrogen vacancy centers in nano diamonds. Uh, basically, these are nano diamonds with lots of defects there. And we spin coated uh, these nano diamonds on the surface of iron dope molecular sulfide monolayers. And this technique relies on the optically detected magnetic resonance, ODMR of the electron spins of nitrogen centers with microwave radiation. The optically detected magnetic resonance spectra here, ODMR spectra here, show the energy split, energy splitting of 21 uh, megahertz in the vicinity of the sample, significantly larger than the undoped case. So undoped case 10 megahertz from the pseudo magnetic field, and uh, this case is 21 megahertz. So you have this huge, uh, energy splitting here, um, widening here. 
And this result further in indicates the presence of local magnetic field because this was uh, performed locally at room temperature. Um, and uh, the local magnetic field was also calculated uh, to be 0.5 millitesla here at the room temperature. Uh, this is comparable to the values measured in 2D chromium triodide at cryogenic temperature. We have also performed superconducting quantum interference device measurement or SQUID and a lot of people also a lot of review uh, papers uh, say that uh, SQUID cannot be used to perform this because uh, this is too, uh, the signal will be too weak but uh, uh, we have uh, done this with uh, Columbia University as well as uh, Argonne National Lab and both uh, cases we obtain all these uh, results. So the difference from the previous measurement here is this squid measurement would measure on average the magnetic fields from the samples as, as opposed to local effect. So uh, measuring this local and atomic level uh, magnetization is important, right? Uh, magnetic optical measurement is important, but at the same time, measuring this average effect is equally important here. This uh, measurement will complement the previous local magnetic field measurement here. So here, iron dope molded sulfide monolayers exhibit a pronounced hysteresis loop at both cryogenic and room temperatures. And here, the magnitude of the hysteresis loop decreases uh, with increasing temperature. So here, 5K is red and 300K is blue here. But the Curie temperature has not been reached at 300K. I think it's possible that the Curie temperature of this material is much higher than the room temperature, although we have no way to prove it. One concern uh, regarding this doping process was about iron residues uh, that might affect the magneto-optical measurements. But we measure everything after cleaning and annealing, so it, it, there shouldn't be any residue. But nevertheless, we have performed this series of control experiments per request by you know, uh, reviewers. <laughs> so uh, low magnification STM images here, along with the ADS spectra, confirm that the surface of iron doped sample is free of iron oxide sample. If there is any iron oxide samples on top, then you will see from the EDS. But again, we don't see the EDS is not sensitive enough to pick up the signal from substitution or atoms, but we really don't see anything, okay? Here, the signature from the carbon is from the PMMA residue left during the transfer process to the TM3 here, okay? The AFM images and optical images also further confirm that the surface of the sample is free from any potential residues after kneading and uh, cleaning. Lastly, we measured the magnetization curves of undoped and uh, iron doped tungsten sulfide monolayers. That's in addition, in addition to the those uh, molybdo sulfide, molybdo sulfide on the left and tungsten sulfide on the right, and using squid, of course, at the room temperature. Of note is that the magnetization data of any tungsten surface samples do not show a measurable magnetic phase transition at room temperature. Here, we only done the uh, room temperature measurement here. Um, according to DFT calculations, the absence of ferromagnetism in this sample at room temperature may arise from the presence of paired iron atoms in, in the sample. And the modeling predicts that the magnetic moments of paired iron atoms are weaker in tungsten sulfide than molybdenum sulfide. And these contrasting magnetic behaviors can be attributed to paired iron atoms again, generating more accumulated electric charge in uh, iron doped tungsten sulfide sample by pulling the iron atoms apart, according to the you know, DFT calculator. We also obtained the ODMR, the optically uh, detected magnetic resonance here, for the tungsten sulfide sample as well, in addition to molybdenum sulfide. And this show again, no local magnetic strengths at room temperature. See, you don't, you don't see any difference, right? Uh, with and without doping here. So the fact that there's no preserved magnetization in iron dope tungsten dope sulfide is another indication that the magnetic phase transition shown in iron dope molybdenum sulfide comes only from uh, the doped iron atoms. Make sense? So these results combined with other theoretical and experimental results completely rule out potential iron residues or contamination from the samples. Although in our experiments, no room temperature ferromagnetism was, uh, was found in our sample, and recent work from Terranos group showed that vanadium doped tungsten sulfide monolayers enable ferromagnetism at room temperature. So uh, I have not studied this uh, paper yet, but uh, this is an interesting development relating to the use of different dopants towards achieving room temperature ferromagnetism. So I, I think there are still a lot of materials that we could pursue to achieve room temperature or better uh, uh, materials here. 
Finally, regarding the doping concentration, we have not done much of work. Uh, we, our doping concentration, concentration was up to 0.6%, was very low. But from another recent theoretical and experimental studies on the room temperature ferromagnetism of vanadium doped tungsten the solenoid, or, or published in 2020, it appears that low doping concentration is preferred for room temperature ferromagnetism. We don't have a deep understanding on this, but the paper claims that the area of magnetic domain becomes smaller as the doping concentration increases. So this is another topic that we may want to look into as well. So in summary, we synthesize and characterize uh, TMDs, including molydosulfide, tungsten dosulfide, tungsten dosulfide, as well as their hero structures. And we uh, illuminated the role of the similar 2D substrates, uncovering the conditions for air stability. And we demonstrated ferromagnetism with high Curie temperature. And we furthermore measured the uh, local magnetic field strengths up to 0.5 millitesla. Here, this magnetic field 0.5 millitesla, this uh, strength is too weak to collect even a paper clip using it. But it is strong enough to alter the spin of electron. That means this research therefore uh, paves the way to create new opportunities towards atomic lithium, magnetic optical, and magnetic electric devices for ultra complex spintronics, on chip optical communications, and quantum computing in the future. Okay. I'd like to acknowledge my students, especially Xi Chen Fu and uh, Kyung Nam Kang, the co first authors of the work recently published in Nature Communications and Advanced Materials, which I uh, mostly talked about today. I also thank uh, Stefan Straff and other co authors as well as collaborators for this research. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, EH, for the uh, very nice talk and uh, for the impressive work. Um, yeah, let's give uh, uh, EH a round of applause. Thank you.